Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds and bodies to the recreating power of your word, that we may see the world through the mind of Christ and live in the world as a foretaste of your new creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's reading is from Luke, Luke 15. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of your property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So we set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. And he replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice Because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, last week, Pastor Taylor spoke about a rich young man who was experiencing so much financial gravity that he could not bear to break free uh, and accept Jesus' invitation to be a disciple. He could not or he would not uh, submit one area of his life to Christ, which was his wealth. Today we're going to consider another rich young man who appears in the Gospels. He's the character in the parable Jesus told about a loving father. He's the younger of two sons who feels financial gravity with such force that he goes to his father and he asks for his inheritance early. That was probably a fun conversation, don't you think? Can you imagine how the family would react to the younger son's wish? I think the anger would be about as high as the hurt would be deep. This young man wanted to pursue fully the kingdom of self, 
We can just hear the exotic call from the far country that's pulling him to set out on this great adventure. And yet he didn't know that he was about to be sucked into a black hole. You know, a black hole is a place in space where gravity is so great that nothing can escape its pull, not even light. Which is why black holes can only they can't be seen. Once something enters the gravitational field of a black hole, the effect is dramatic. The kingdom of self is a similar kind of space, full of black holes. For many of us, money and the things that it buys can produce a level of gravity from which we simply can't escape. One of the worst combinations in this regard is to place a large sum of money in the hands of a person uh, who has low spiritual or emotional maturity. His spending choices, uh, like this man in the parable, the spending choices were predictable. He wasted his wealth through extravagant living. He was immature. His vision was limited. He couldn't see beyond the immediate moment. He couldn't see beyond himself. He lived fast and large until it was all gone. And then he stumbled away in regret when a famine picked the last denarii from his pocket. So down and out, his only friends were some hungry pigs. And yet in that moment, his memory got jogged. He remembers his father's generosity, even to those that worked for him. Scripture says in a wonderful way that he came to himself. He remembered whose he was. He goes home. He's ready to grovel. His father sees him from a long way off and throws all of the social rules aside and starts just running. Full on running to greet his son, hugging him, giving him a new robe and ring, placing sandals on his feet and calling for a celebration. See, here I think is the key to understanding this parable. The father rejoices at the son's return. This is a lesson about joy. Twice the scripture says to us, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Joy and celebration. Despite all that has happened, the father's heart is thankful and joyful. Thankful that his son is alive, that he's home, that he's come to his true self. Can you imagine what this kind of welcome must have done to restore the younger son? Think of how it must have changed that younger boy's character. The selfish boy died in a distant land and a new man was resurrected in his place thanks to his father's love. We can imagine that rather than thinking about himself, now he looked for the needs of others. His extravagant living in some distant land, that no longer appealed to him. Being with his father enjoying the company of his father and his family, doing the will of his father would now be what brought him joy. He'd be kinder. He'd be more gracious. Most important of all, rather than simply being the recipient of his father's generosity, he now possessed the insight to become a participant, to be generous to others. Just as the pull of financial gravity was evident in the the young son's life, we can see it in our own. Often our prayers to God are about things that we hope to receive. We ask for guidance to make decisions, good health and recovery from illness, comfort for the bereaved, jobs and money to pay the bills, healing in our relationships, countless other requests as well. And we should ask those things. And our desire, though, however well intended, is often to acquire or to receive from God rather than to serve God. I think there's a moment of epiphany for those that follow Christ when we acknowledge, when we recognize the difference between being a beneficiary of God's kingdom 
and being a participant in God's kingdom. When you find yourself uh, submitting your kingdom of self to the kingdom of God, good things begin to happen. And this orientation toward God's kingdom is life-altering. It creates an identity that's found in generosity. Generous people see themselves and their lives and their purpose differently than those people whose lives are weighed down by financial gravity. Generous people are more, well, are more interested in what they can give than in what they will get. Now part of this change is that generous people become stewards. A steward is a person who manages another person's property. Stewards have broad discretionary powers over how an account is managed or how the household is run. They know that they're primarily servants, looking not for their own self-interest, but in the welfare of the owner. Christ followers understand that they are stewards of a gift given to them by God, a life with unique strengths, talents, abilities, and resources to be used in a way that are guided by God's own spirit and that live, that spirit that lives in them so as to honor and to glorify God, the giver of the gifts. Sadly, I think that often we don't truly act as God's stewards. And I think there's a reason for that. It's this financial gravity. It pulls us toward a deep belief that we're the sole owners of what we possess and that we can use it to support a lifestyle that we desire. Being an owner means that we think that we're, make, we're free to make decisions of the control, even, and even the consideration of others, to make decisions that are free of the control of others. We submit to no one when financial gravity holds us back. I think this is honestly, this is about the United States. Most of, the, most of us live like owners, not stewards. According to a group called the, the Philanthropy Roundtable, 33% of Americans gave nothing last year. No charitable giving at all. In fact, of America's 50 biggest cities, Austin ranked way down at 36th in charitable giving. Folks, Dallas ranked 8th. <laughs> Dallas. Turns out that they give 40% more to charity than Austin. Now, you might be thinking, but at least people gave their time, right? Because time's incredibly valuable, which is, which is true. Your time serving is valuable. But it turns out that same survey found that only 25% of people reported volunteering for any organization last year. That means it's likely that most people who didn't give money also didn't serve in their community. This is just by the numbers. It seems that there's a generosity famine afoot. So here's the thing. Lack of generosity is not about resources. It is about identity. Stewards understand their custodial agents of whatever sum they administer. They manage money and assets with the thought of pleasing the true owner. And in that they find joy in giving. Now, I want to talk just for a moment about the older son, because the older son had his hang-ups as well. He felt burned by the actions of his younger brother. He had a grudge to bear, and he was not going to let it go. His first thought was not joyful. He's experiencing a gravity there as well. Financial gravity, but also a gravity of resentment. He resents the reception of the younger that the younger brother receives. And in addition to whatever money he's hoarding away, the older son is hoarding judgment, burdens, and the idea perhaps that he is earning his inheritance. The older brother needs to sacrifice his resentment and, claim superiority, and the claim of superiority before he can join in the joy of the celebration. You see, in order to become a steward of financial resources, one has to accept the challenge to set aside an amount of money to invest in the work of God's kingdom. 
Many Christians, as a way to get serious about their desire to participate in God's work, pursue generosity through proportional giving to their, of their income uh, with a tithe as a goal. A tithe is a tenth of one's income. And for these Christians, a tithe is the first and the best of what they have, not what's last or what's left over. The tithe was a practice that God gave the people of Israel. The money from the tithe was to support the worship life in Israel and to care, about, care for the most vulnerable in society. Now let's face it, if everything is a gift from God, God asks us not to tithe because God is short of money. Clearly, God is not in need of the tithe. Instead, the tithe is requested for our own sake, that we can learn the joy and celebration of being generous like God is generous. It seems clear that God intends the tithe to be a discipline that enables us to help expand God's kingdom. We're to give thanks, and as we give our tithe, we become God's servants. Through our generosity, we gain a sense of our identity. And this practice of proportional giving calls us to offer our best for God's kingdom as a way of living into our identity as stewards. Now, this is a lifelong discipline, this practicing of generosity. God shapes and transforms us in the process. We grow and we live into this identity. We've been studying the book Defying Gravity, and the author of that book, Tom Berlin, he tells a story about Miss Margaret, a woman who was in her 90s when he met her. He sat at her kitchen table one day, and the topic of giving came up. Miss Margaret, uh, uh, who at the time had, had grown up in, uh, in the times of the Depression and the recovery afterward, she talked about how important giving was to her life. And the joy that she found in giving a tithe. Let's hear Miss Margaret's story. I have always tithed, and I am so glad that I did. It is one of the decisions that brought greater meaning to my life. My husband died when we were young. My son and daughter were children. Then one day I was at a meeting of the ladies auxiliary at the church and they announced what would be done with the thank offering that was taken every November. I came home sad because I knew we couldn't do that. There just wasn't a penny left over. My son saw that I was sad and asked me what was bothering me. I told him that I wanted to be a part of the thank offering in November, but even with all the time between now and November, I wouldn't be able to help. He said that if I wanted to give to that offering, we would do it together. We put a mason jar on the kitchen table. He and his sister took odd jobs, doing farm work or pulling weeds in gardens. They didn't make much, but they would bring their pennies and nickels home and put them in the jar. The country was still recovering from the depression. It was hard for a woman to find a job. I had to work and take care of the children. I took in sewing and would put any money we didn't need in the jar. We kept a garden and we watched our money, but I always wanted my children to see that giving was a part of life. I just took that portion out first and we lived on the rest. And it was hard, but we did it. Bit by bit, pennies turned to nickels, nickels turned to dimes, and then quarters. By the time November came around, we had a few dollars. I had the children come with me to the meeting and together we put our offering on the table with everyone else's. I think it was one of the proudest and happiest things we ever did together. Think about the way that Miss Margaret shaped the life of her family through generosity. As she was learning to be generous, her children were learning to be generous. Now, whether your tithe fits in a mason jar or in a charitable trust, you can do the same. The only way to gain her joy was to take on the practice. As Christians, we're called to be stewards of, of all that we have, from our possessions and our money and our time and our abilities. 
God calls us to be faithfully employed in God's service. Yet all too often, financial gravity restricts and inhibits true stewardship. We hold tight instead of letting go. Many people who love God want to honor Christ and seek the will of the Holy Spirit in their lives, but haven't made the move from being a recipient of God's grace to being a generous participant in God's kingdom. The problem's not that people lack desire. Most people who, most people who don't give simply can't give. They haven't practiced. Their generosity hasn't been nourished. Next week, Pastor Taylor is going to speak with you about learning how to align your life for generosity. And I'll ask that you do a little bit of preparation for her message. Consider the two brothers from our scripture. In which of the ways are you kind of like one or both of the brothers? Does financial gravity pull on you on the spending side or on the hoarding side or sometimes both? Are you generous with your time in serving God and others? Inside your bulletin, you're going to find this week that you've got a generosity commitment card and a time and talent survey. We're asking you to reflect on your financial generosity in support of our ministries and to consider how you would like to share your talents in support of our ministries. We're calling on you to make a prayerful commitment to practice generosity in the year ahead to consider tithing, and to grow. And yes, you can put the card in the plate this week. We will, uh, we will receive it this week as well. But next week is a particular opportunity for us to do so together in worship so that we can celebrate our commitments to be generous. One of the ways that we're going to celebrate is that next week, right after the 11 o'clock service, we're going to have a picnic on the lawn of the Capitol. Everyone's invited. We have arranged for three great food trucks to be on site for you to bring to purchase your food. Bring a picnic blanket. Some cha- we'll bring out some chairs. And let's just enjoy being together as the church. Bring a game. Line up for pinata. Celebrate what God is doing in our midst. In fact, you can pull out your communication card right now and you can write picnic on it and you can RSVP. That would help us to know that you're coming. May we celebrate with joy what God is doing through our lives and through this church. Let's give thanks and let's dream big for what God has in store for us in 2018. Amen.